Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and we're going to continue on in our study through the first epistle to the Thessalonians verse by verse. We're at the end of chapter 4. We're in the passage dealing with our being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so I'd like to sort of hover over this for several videos and spend some time talking about it because there's a lot there in the text that really is worth addressing. So I thank you for all of your continued support as we go forward in our studies verse by verse. I hope everyone out there is staying is well and, and staying safe. These are very interesting times that we are living and we're fastly approaching 2021. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, our timeline. Uh, for spring of 2021, our blessed hope is that we'll be with the Lord before summer of next year. So we're going to continue on in chapter 4. And uh, I've been used to the King James Version. You may, you may hear me quote uh, at times from the New American Standard. But we're going we're gonna to go back over this, and, and by the time we get to the end of chapter 5, uh, I'm still going to do, I hope to be able to do a review, a sort of a recap of the entire epistle of 1 Thessalonians before we go into 2 Thessalonians. One of the most uh, elaborate and precisely worded portions of Scripture dealing with the rapture is found here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. It's also one of the most difficult to deal with because the implications of it are highly complex in view of the fact that it's a time of reunion, not only of those whom God put to sleep, who are asleep in Christ, but also of saints who are still living at the time of the Lord's return. The passage really does deserve, and it really does require, very careful analysis. There are several really special things about these verses. Uh, that's not to say that all of Scripture isn't special, but there's some very intriguing and, and interesting things about these particular verses. In the first place, Paul makes it clear that he views what he's about to say as particularly important. He says at the start, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, what I'm about to say to you is intended above all to be a comfort and a reassurance. And I also want you to know that I have received this revelation as from the Lord. I pointed out numerous times, I, I continue to point out that this, this is not Paul's reasoning, Paul's thoughts, Paul's logic that we're looking at, but God Almighty. I believe that there are seven things that all Christians know. You know, we, we seem to differ on, when it comes to a lot of, of opinions, but I, I think there's seven that we all know, or at least most Christians all know, in any study on biblical eschatology. In general, seven things. At least seven things I've seen. Number one is that Christ will return. Number two is those in Christ are caught up to meet the Lord. Number three is there'll be a, an apostasy, a, a falling away. And number four, that the man of sin is revealed, the Antichrist. And number five, the great tribulation period, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, actually the seven years, as well as the latter part, the great tribulation, the kingdom age, and number seven, that the unrighteous are also judged. Now I think it's worthy to point out and pay, and pay close attention to the grammar here uh, in this text as well as any other text that we're looking at. The word asleep there in the, in the text is a perfect passive. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the passive voice, it's the subject did not produce the action. The subject was acted upon by an outside source, and in this case, God. So asleep is a perfect passive. He put us to sleep. It's also worthy to take note of, extremely important in my opinion, 
that he put us to sleep in Jesus, in Christ. There have been many a sermon preached on the subject of in Christ and what that means to be in Christ. If we believe that he rose, and we really do, it's, that's a first class condition. Believers know that he rose from the dead. If you don't believe that, well, if you don't believe he rose from the dead, I hardly see how you can be a believer. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not just the, the, the immediate text that we need to look at, but we need to look at cross references and all of those verses which come in and lend support to the text in which we're studying here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Stop for a moment and think about what those words are saying. Once you leave this body, whether it's uh, through physical death or, or the rapture, at that very moment, you are with the Lord. But the question here is in what state does the saint exist in this intermediate state? If I were to die today, what state would I exist in if I was waiting for the rapture to occur in physical time, actually, you know, real time? I want you to take note of the fact that sleep means just what it means. We can't take and, and twist that word to mean anything other than what it means. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, yet we sleep. That is, if we die, we sleep. The word is a, it has a, a Christian connotation. The word uh, it refers to the bedroom. This is why Christians rarely use the, the term graveyard, which is a pagan term. Cemetery literally means the bedroom. So we are asleep in Christ. But in what state do we exist? Are we there as a, as a disembodied spirit in heaven awaiting the rapture? That's my question. Now, many of you who followed these videos know that that is not what I believe at all. I'll give you my opinion on that, and that is all that is, as, as I've often done in past videos. I'm not asking anybody to agree with me. You have to make up your mind for yourself, but He will bring with Him those who are asleep. What does that mean? What does it mean that He'll bring with Him those who are asleep? Yet, Scripture says that no man hath ascended, that is, gone up, is the Greek word, into the heaven. No man. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, John 3, 13. Now, if you were to pause long enough to meditate over those words, there is no explaining away the fact that what our Lord said is true, that no man has ascended or gone up into the heaven. And we tend to think that uh, our loved ones are there, uh, waiting on us in a, uh, without a body, without a, a new perfect body, in some intermediate state in which their spirit is there, but they don't really have a body. And then they're going to be brought back, put back in the grave, to rise again to meet the Lord Again, let me emphasize the word again. Now you've got two meetings of the Lord. That is not my, my, my personal view on that. If that's your view, that's fine, but that's not what I believe. That's not what I believe at all. This is a fact that confirms the believer sleeps, okay? That no man hath ascended unto heaven. Then we which remain, that is a present passive, Asleep and remain are both passive voices in the Greek. Both are ordained by God. And those passive voices, folks, ought to speak peace to our hearts. The dead rise first. Well, there's been a whole lot of, of, of confusion and bewilderment and puzzlement over that, and even jokes made of that. What does that mean that the dead rise first? I'm going to tell you what I think that means, which I believe is, is more in harmony with Scripture than what many of us have difficulty comprehending. Why would these individual believers rise first? 
And what, what is a, a few seconds or a microsecond, what, what does that matter? Why would these rise first? Then the command to comfort one another only makes sense if the rapture is pre-trib, folks, because a tribulation rapture is no comfort at all. At least it's not to me. Now, it may be to you, but it's not to me, and I don't believe that is in harmony with Scripture. Never mind the fact that the church would serves no purpose in Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, which we refer to as the tribulation period. So we are put to sleep by God. There is no death for the believer. We passed out of death into life. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So whether alive or dead, we go to be with the Lord. The very nature, folks, of eternity guarantees that the Spirit is not unclothed in the Lord's presence, but clothed in a body like His. Eternity, clothed body. Not unclothed. Not naked. I do not believe that we go to heaven, if we die, that we go to heaven as a disembodied spirit. I'm gonna, I hope to explain why. I've done this in previous videos. I think it's worth doing again. Our death is the return of the Lord, I believe, I believe it marks, in, in fact, it marks that last day for the departing believer where we are carried instantly forward in time with all the other saints to the great day of His coming. That time is eclipsed because we are asleep. The same would be true of Paul. The same would be true of Abraham, Moses. Moses has been sleeping a lot longer than Paul. But in, it is my belief that at, when the rapture occurs, that it will appear to Paul as if he was just beheaded. Okay? I believe that our death is the rapture. Now, I know that this may seem a difficult concept to grasp, but it is, in fact, agreeable to many passages of Scripture. John 14.3 promises a delay while Luke 23:43, the penitent thief on the cross, along with 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and Philippians chapter 1, assures us that there is no delay. So how do we reconcile these verses? I'm convinced that we shall immediately be with the Lord, but I'm equally convinced that we will need our bodies. I'm also convinced that there will be no delay in, in Christ receiving our bodies, but yet, or our receiving our bodies, but yet there will be an interval. It is possible to reconcile these apparent contradictions when we come to realize that time and eternity are two separate, distinct realities. I think our problem is in our viewing eternity as an extension of time in which time does not exist. Paul wants God's people to know with absolute certainty that when he returns, when the Lord returns, he'll first raise those who have died in the faith, and only then will he call up to be w with himself those of his people who at that moment are still alive. The departed saints and the still living saints alike are transformed and made perfect in spirit and body to be forever with the Lord in the most wonderful assembly, and that word there, assembly, is meeting. The word in the Greek is meeting that the mind can conceive. In, in what form do the dead exist that God will have the Lord bring with Him? Verse 14, when He returns. The language is very specific. Since the Spirit returns to God at death and is preserved in God's keeping until it's reunited uh, with its body again, and since the spirit without the body is not conscious but asleep, we have to try to visualize in what form these spirits are brought back by Jesus to the earth. Clearly, their sleeping spirits are brought back with their resurrected bodies. Think, dearly beloved, 
if they've already been with Jesus in heaven, and we can't throw away the Lord's words that, that said, no man hath gone up to heaven, then for them, the rapture would not be a first meeting, but a second one. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, that is, Christians who have departed this scene, shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, or the, the word the is not there, in clouds, to meet the Lord in air. The word the is not there either. In air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not simply the bodies of the dead, but the dead. Those persons who have died that He put to sleep will rise to meet the Lord in the air. And yet somehow we've been bamboozled, I, I think, into believing that they died, they met the Lord, then they're put back in their bodies, uh, they're put back in the grave to rise up and, and, and meet the Lord again. And folks, my brain just can't compute that. The thief on the cross was promised, Today shall you be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23. So I'm told to believe that the Lord was, was with the thief in paradise that day while he was also in the grave that very same day. Surely his body was in the grave. The thief received a promise that on that very day he would be accompanying the Lord as God when we know our Lord went to announce his victory over death to the spirits in prison, 1 Peter 3. Was the thief with Christ then? And this while his body lie in the tomb. Now, I understand anything's possible, folks, but listen. He existed as God before the spirits in prison, but not as man. So the thief, who was a man, could in no way have been with him who was God only. In my opinion. Therefore, the promise could not have meant today in our sense of today in the temporal sense but only in the experiential sense as far as the thief was concerned it, it was that day and the reason it was that day is because i believe our death is the rapture and i will raise him up at the last day said our lord i believe this last day is a reference to the thief's last day as well as yours and my last day Perhaps God preserves our spirits as, as a kind of memory in His divine mind to be later recreated at will. After all, nothing existed until God created it. Everything created was first a thought in the mind of God. Until He spoke, it wasn't done. So, it, it won't be difficult for God to reconstitute the dead in Christ, body and spirit alike, when the time comes for the Lord's return. So I believe we are all to be present with Him, presented together, okay? Presented together. Us with you, Paul affirms. We go into His presence as a family, and that would include the thief on the cross, that would include Paul and every other saint, whether living or asleep. So which is it? I mean, do we, if we die, experience a, a sort of relatively happy, uh, non-complete sort of uh, impersonal existence, or do we simply sleep through the problem? You know, so we end up either with a disembodied spirit that's fully conscious of a certain incompleteness while we're waiting on the rapture, or we end up in the, the total unconsciousness of a deep sleep until we're awakened to rejoin our bodies. Where the phrase present with the Lord merely describes where we sleep. And, and I gotta ask, I mean, how could there even be joy while awaiting judgment? I mean, that such a judgment is in store for us is quite clear. 
How could we be at ease in his presence while we await the judge's decision, knowing that after a while, he'll pronounce judgment on our lives? Unlike many, many Christians, I don't, I don't believe heaven or hell is full of disembodied spirits, ghosts without a body. The rich man's got a tongue, Lazarus has a finger, uh, Abraham has a bosom. You know, tongue, finger, bosom belong to a body. I believe the last day in this life of each of us becomes like the last day of every other believer, the last day which marks the coming of the Lord to receive us unto Himself. Therefore, these last days are all kaleidoscoped, if you will, into a single event as each one of us passes out of time into eternity together, marking that one and same great day of the Lord. It's this great gathering together which marks uh, our, our death, the death of every saint, not a separation to a single meeting with the Lord, but a reunion. A reunion with His resurrected body and a reunion with all the other saints, past, present, and future. In the present world, nothing is permanent. Once we step outside this present world, the flow of time as we now know it, as we now experience it, will cease to exist. There will be no conscious waiting, no marking time, no longing for that which is yet future, no waiting judgment, no missing or, or waiting upon the arrival of our loved ones, nothing, nothing, because the rapture is one grand reunion. I've often called it the cosmic surprise of the ages. Now this is the view I hold to. The most important time marker to which history now moves forward is the day which we've all been longing for, the rapture. I believe that day marks for the Lord's people a focal point. It's the day of their reception into His presence, faultless and with exceeding joy. I believe this reception is firmly anchored to our departure from this body, whether we died or remained until the day of His coming. And that when we examine all the facts surrounding this subject, that we are driven by what is clearly revealed in Scripture to conclude that these two events, His coming and our departure, are in fact a single event, both occurring at one and the same instant. If this is true for Adam and for Abel as it is for for Abraham and Paul, you know, for you and for me, then clearly the Lord's coming again occurs simultaneously with the death of Adam and the death of Abel and the death of Paul and your death and my death. Though as viewed by the record of history, these deaths are spaced over an immense period of time. Yet as seen in the light of eternity, these, all these deaths all occur at the same moment, the, the moment of his return. That when Adam dies, he steps out of time and he passes at once to meet the returning Lord. And when Paul dies over 3,000 years later, he too steps at once into the promise of the same returning Lord. Since for both men, the return of the Lord marks for them their journey out of time, both of them make that journey across Jordan simultaneously and therefore together in company with one another. Where there's no time, there can be no greater or lesser delay in being received by our Lord. That historical setting has no, no relevance, folks. It, it does in, in, in prospect for the individual, but not at the moment of, his occur, of its occurring. It does while we are still dwelling in time and death is still future, but not when the rapture occurs and we make that journey out of time into eternity. So I believe that once our feet touch the waters of Jordan, so to speak, each of us instantly move forward to the same point in eternity and we pass over together to meet the Lord. It's clear that since time is eclipsed when we begin this journey, the death of each saint must mark for him the end of time. The last day of this life is for him not merely his last day, but the last day of which the Lord spoke as the climax of the present age. Because it was then that the Lord said He would raise us up. I will raise Him up at the last day. John chapter 6. That's like saying, 
I will raise him up on his last day. But more than this, the last day of the believer and the last day of the unbeliever alike becomes also the day of judgment. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the Lord's people are assured of being kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, not unto judgment, but unto a salvation that, as Peter puts it, is ready to be revealed in the last time. I think, and, and folks, stop for a moment. Don't pass over those words, folks. Okay, we are kept by the faithfulness of God. Don't let anybody bamboozle you into thinking that the merit, the rapture is merit based or that we're saved because of our own good works. We're kept by the faithfulness of God. I think part of our problem here has been that, that we have, we have interposed a space of time between our departure from this life and the last day when our bodies are to be resurrected, where in fact there is no time for, for such a, a space to exist in. We've done this because we have confused time and eternity, making eternity not so much an, inter, uh, an entirely different order of experience, but merely an extension of time, and time merely a fragment of eternity. And that doesn't make any sense. What I do know is that when I find myself in His wonderful presence, it won't be as a miserable wretch apologizing before God for my ragged soul that, that would seem scarcely worth the price of its purchase. It'll be a glorious new me. It'll be a, a perfected spirit with all that belongs to the old sinful self buried and done with forever, re reunited with a resurrected body made like unto His glorious body, to form in some satisfying way a new yet identifiable Stephen Sewell. But because that name represents the old person and not the new, that name, like the old, like the old person it represents, will no longer be used or even remembered. I'll have a new name. This is the promise, folks, of eternity. A glorious new nature, worthy to behold the Lord in His glory and to form a part of His royal court. Meanwhile, if I should die, I don't look for the Lord's return as an event that coming sometime after I depart from this scene. That's only for those who remain. I'll have slept through those days or years marked by time. I look for it the very moment that I'm put to sleep. I'm called home to be with Him. I expect to be raptured the moment I was put to sleep by God in my experience, though you, others may have continued to live on through what we know as time. And I have every confidence of joining Him with all His saints who have gone before me and with all who will have come after me. If I'm not alive when the rapture occurs, it won't matter because my death will for me, in my opinion, mean the rapture. Look, I love you all. I truly do. We'll pick up here next time. We'll continue on with the la latter part of this chapter. There's, there's more I want to say about it. And then we'll move into chapter five. Thank you for all your continued love, prayers, and support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.